So solve for x and y. In this warm-up, we have, competing with the announcements, we have a quadrilateral inscribed in a circle. And we learned when a quadrilateral was inscribed in a circle, we learned something about the opposite angles. So look at your notes for that. So um, the key to this problem is just don't accidentally get caught in the quadrilateral unit when parallelograms opposite angles were congruent. We don't want to set the opposite angles equal. We want to add them to equal 180, okay? So we want to do 2x plus 7y plus 91 equals 180. And then we want to do, so let's move this guy. 7x plus y plus 80 equals 180. And what does this look like to you? It looks like a system of equations. Very good. So what I recommend is I would move the 91 and the 80 over. I would do that first, so let's go ahead and do that. So if I move those over, I have 2x plus 7y equals 89. 7x plus y equals 100. So now I'm organized. I have all my x's lined up, I have all my y's lined up, and I have all my integers lined up. Lined up. Okay. We can't just subtract these yet because nothing's going to cancel. We want to eliminate a variable. So what I would recommend is multiplying that second one by negative 7. Multiply the second one by negative 7. So if I multiplied this guy by negative 7, I'm just going to write it above. I would have what? Negative 49x minus 7y equals negative 700. Okay. Now I'm going to add these together. So we get negative 47x. These cancel equals, they're both going to be negative. The negatives will cancel, by the way. Now, we hope and we pray that 611 is divisible by 47. Is it divisible? Yay! Score! It is. So, when you divide both sides by 47, you get x is 13. A beautiful integer. Maybe a little unlucky, but a beautiful integer. Once you have x, you've done all the hard work. You can just plug it back in to get y. I would plug it back in to um, this equation right here. 7 times 13 plus y equals 100. So then we just do 7 times 13, 91, and we do 100 minus 91 to get y is So when a quadrilateral is inscribed in a circle, Opposite angles are supplementary. That's the moral of that story. Okay. Before we do the last lesson of the unit, let's talk about everything we know so far. We know how to solve all seven of these angles. Okay, so we know that angle one is a central angle. We know that central angles are equal to their arc. They equal their arc. Yes, you have to memorize this. Um, number two is an inscribed angle. We know that inscribed angles are one half of their arc. So you find the intercepted arc and you divide by two, 70 and 35. Number three, it's not an inscribed angle, but you can treat it just like an inscribed angle. So if this angle is 60, then this, oh sorry, if that arc is 60, then this angle is 30. So we treat it just like, oops, I can't talk and write at the same time. We treat it just like an inscribed angle because the angle's on the circle, the vertex is on the circle. So equals the arc, one half the arc, one half the arc. Then we get down here and we look at where the vertex is. On this one, the vertex is inside and on all three of these, outside, outside, outside. So a reminder, when it's inside, we're going to add our arcs and divide by 2. And when it is, the vertex is outside, we're going to subtract our arcs and divide by 2. So that's a summary of every angle you could encounter in and out of a circle. Got that? 
Those should be committed to memory. Your quiz is over this tomorrow. Your quiz is over angles and arcs tomorrow. Quiz, daily grade, angles and arcs tomorrow. No segments. There are no segments on the quiz. Okay. The next thing we learned, we learned about a lot of segments and lines. This slide is not about angles. This is not what your quiz is over, but of course it'll be on your test. Um, so we learned three tangent theorems and three chord theorems, okay? What did we learn? The first one is the one you'll use the most often. When a radius meets a tangent line, you get a right angle. So, when a radius meets a tangent line, you get a right angle. That was theorem number one. You need to add a right angle when you see a radius intersecting a tangent line. You're expected to add the marking. The marking will not be there on the picture. Number two, I called it the ice cream cone theorem or the snow cone theorem. We learned that if two tangent lines come from the same exterior point, they are congruent. So you're expected to know that they're congruent and add your own tick marks on the test. Number three, we also learned, and we honestly don't use this one as often. We don't use it very often. But we learned if we have two tangent lines coming from the same exterior point, and we draw the segment that connects the center to that exterior point, that it bisects that angle. So that was theorem number three. Like I said, it's a little more rare. Good. Let's talk about chords. Then we learned about chords. We learned three theorems about chords. We learned if the radius is perpendicular to a chord, the radius cuts the chord in half and it cuts the arcs in half. I can't really put tick marks on an arc, so I'm just bolding them. Now be careful. Did the radius get cut in half? No, no. The chord got cut in half. The radius did the cutting in half. The radius did the bisecting. Okay, that's theorem number one. Theorem number two about chords is that if two chords are equidistant from the center, that's what this means. If they are equidistant from the center, then by golly, those chords are the same length. If that chord's eight, then this chord is eight. So chords equidistant from the center are congruent. That was the second theorem we learned about chords. The third theorem we learned is that congruent chords, congruent chords intercept congruent arcs. So if this arc is a 32 degree arc, then this arc is a 32 degree arc. Congruent chords intercept congruent arcs. And there is our whole circles unit in two slides. Let's move on to the last lesson of the unit. It's called segments of circles, or I actually, I'd rather you call it segments in circles because a segment of a circle is technically the shaded region right here. That's a segment of a circle. Now we're going to talk about the length of segments in circles. It's a little confusing, but don't worry about it. Okay, we are going to just dive into our theorems. Guess how many theorems we have today? Three. Three is like our number, guys. We had three over tangents, three over chords, and we have three theorems today. Please do not write all those words down. Please do not write all those words down. Go ahead and copy the picture and copy the formula. I'll give you a minute to copy that, and then I'll talk about it. So, what is this saying? This is pretty much saying that when two chords intersect in a circle, the parts of those chords are proportional. But we're going to look at it as... Um, as a product. The products equal each other. So what is this saying? This is saying AE times EC, so segment one times segment two, the product of the pieces is equal to DE times EB, three times four. So the one times the two equals the three times the four. The product of the segments are equal when two chords intersect each other in a circle. Okay? Okay. So let's try it. Example number one. Find the value of x. Now, we could easily mess, mess this up if we multiply the wrong things. What the theorem says is that if two chords intersect, if two chords intersect, the products of each piece of the chord are equal. And I'm not really saying this very well. But what it's saying is that keep the 12 with the 5 and keep the 6 with the x, okay? So it's saying 
12 times 5 equals 6 times x. If you see this a different way and you see proportions and you want to do it that way, that's fine. It is a proportional relationship. Okay? X is 10, yes. Okay. So 12 times 5 is 60. 60 equals 6x. Divide by 6 and x is 10. Not bad. The math is not bad, but remembering all these theorems, that's what's going to get us. So we need to practice a lot with them. The more you practice with them, the less you'll have to memorize. That's what I always say. Okay. A, E is 8. C, A, careful. C, A, that whole thing is 12. B, E is 5. Find B, D. Let me give you a minute to work it and then we'll go over it. So if we are going to set this problem up just like the one we set up on the last slide, we're going to need to do a few things first, some subtracting first, okay? Um, so what I would do first is I would do 12 minus 8. 12 minus 8 is? Obviously the picture's not drawn to scale. And then I would find what how I could write ED in terms of X. So ED would really be X. Minus 5. Is everyone okay with how I'm getting my pieces? I have to have pieces first. Can't have whole chords. I'm going to keep going unless you stop me. So, the theorem says that 4 times 8 equals 5 times x minus 5. The part times the part equals the part times the part. Nowhere in that formula do you see the word whole. Okay, so we had to find our parts first so that we are able to multiply them. The products of the parts are equal. Okay, we have two options here. You could distribute the 5 or you could just divide by 5. It's totally up to you. So I did 4 times 8 and then I divided by 5. I got 6.4. Sorry, going off the board. And then we'll just add 5 to both sides. And so BD is 11.4. You can also put that in fraction form, 57 fifths. Both would be acceptable answers. I would probably go with the decimal one. Yes, you should always use fractions unless the decimal ends cleanly. That's a good way to put it. Victor, that's exactly. Okay. Um, take a look at this picture. I want to just talk about what we would call these segments. What is AB? What is AB? It's a chord. Very good. What is AC? It's tangent, right? So, not a tangent. I'm sorry, a secant. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Scratch that. It's a secant. Now, we, so we have this. We have this is a chord. This is a secant. What would you call, what would the external part of AC be called? The external part of AC. Not a vocab word. Tell me the segment. Do secants have to go forever? Yes. BC, very good. Okay, so... We've got a chord, we've got a secant, and then we've got this thing, We this one doesn't have a name. This segment from here to here doesn't have a name, so we're just going to call it the external part of AC. Do you kind of see where we're coming from? Because we have nothing else to name it. So AB has a name, AC has a name, but BC doesn't have a name, so we're going to call it the external part, because external means outside of our circle. You want to call it a C chord? <laughs> All right, once again, you are not allowed to write that paragraph. You're allowed to draw the picture, and you can write the um, equation. I'll give you a minute to do that. So if we are missing the length of one of these segments, we can find it using this formula. AC times BC equals EC times DC, and now I feel like I'm singing an ACDC song or something. Anyways, so what it means, why I wrote this underneath it, is it boils down to the whole 
times the external equals the whole times the external. This one is not part times part equals part times part. No, in this one, you have to use the whole. Whole times external equals whole times external. This is when we have secants, okay? Let's try it. Be careful. Whole times external equals whole times external. Whole times external equals whole times external. Are we good? Okay. So, we totally got this. Um, like I said last time, you can distribute the 4, but I would just divide by 4. So you have 12 times 3. We're going to divide by 4. And so we have 9 equals x plus 4. And then we subtract 4 from both sides. So x is 5. Whole times external equals whole times external. Moving on. A, B is 2. B, C is 6, E, C is 15, find D, C. This one's easier than the one we just did. Whole times external equals whole times external. Do we have any questions here? You know how I got the 8? Are we okay with that? So it's just 8 times 6 divided by 15. We're getting another decimal, right? 3.2 or 16 fifths, uh huh? We're going to keep going. Last theorem, I promised you there were three theorems come in threes in this unit. And so this is the last theorem. Another thing that could happen is we could have a secant and a tangent. Now, if we had a secant and a tangent, with the tangent line, look at this. With the tangent line, the whole is the external. They're the same thing. The whole is the external. So when I do whole times external, whole times external, it's really just that segment squared because the whole is the external. Does that make sense? So that's why it's tangent squared equals whole times external because the tangent is the whole and the external at the same time. Whoa. So honestly, for this theorem, you don't have to remember anything differently from the last theorem because they're really the same theorem. You can still use whole times external equals whole times external because the whole is the external. Have I said that enough? <laughs> Do you need more time to copy this down? Okay, I'm going to move on. Let's try an example. Tangent squared equals whole times external. All right, here we go. Let's solve this. Now, on this one, you don't have a choice. You have to distribute the x because it's a variable. You can't just divide both sides by x. So this one, we have no choice. 36 equals... 5x plus, we're distributing it. What's x times x? Don't say 2x. x squared. I'm going to ignore that comment. All right, now we're going to move everything to one side of the equation. Why would we move everything to one side of the equation? Yep, because it's a quadratic. It's a factoring problem. So, 0 equals x squared plus 5x minus 36. It's a minus because we moved it. Oh my goodness, we get to do systems and factoring all in one day. Are you so happy? Your algebra teachers are just going to love us because we did not get rid of algebra and geometry. We kept it in there. They're going to be so thankful. All right, we need things that multiply to get 36. Um, 12 and 3, that won't make a 5. 9 and 4, that will make a 5. So we're going to use 9 and 4. We want it to be a positive 5, so we want the larger one to be positive. So x equals negative 9 
and positive 4. Now, do we get rid of one of those or not? X is a segment. Can segments be negative? Not in geometry. They're not allowed to be negative. So the only correct answer is 4. On a test, you would throw out the negative 9 because it's not a valid solution. Out with the negative 9. Off with his head. Out with the negative 9. Okay, just kidding. I totally recorded that. Ready? Um, whole times external equals tangent squared. Is this one a factoring one? It is not a factoring one because there's no middle term. So 44 equals x squared. The opposite of squaring something is square rooting. Can you simplify square root of 44? Are we good? Are we ever even going to think about putting 6.6 .6 as our answer? Absolutely, positively not. That would not be an acceptable answer. That is an approximate answer. That's the symbol for approximate. It's showing up now. Okay. It's an approximate answer. It's not exact. Unacceptable. That's true. Students still do it, though, by the way. They still do it all the time. There's your homework assignment.